Welcome to our ATEL annual conference. Before starting and introducing today's speakers and topics, I wanted to remind you that this year ATEL will celebrate its 27th anniversary. Usually, we take the opportunity of our annual conference to celebrate its anniversary. In a COVID period and with virtual conferences, it is uh, not that easy to celebrate with all of you. Nevertheless, we are pleased at ATEL to keep delivering quality content to organize hybrid conferences and publish newsletters and magazines, even during lockdowns. We all expect to come back soon to a more normal situation and to welcome all of you to our events. As always, we have tried to gather great speakers to address what we consider as important topics in a fast-changing world. I also wanted, together with our board, to thank our sponsors. ING, BNP Paribas, Bearing Point, JP Morgan, Bottom Line, and EY for their outstanding and long-standing support to our organization. We will talk about working capital improvement and B2B payment, SRTP, about diversity in treasury and ESG developments, finding treasury enlightenment in a trap and untapped data, and eventually uh, the new wave of international tax changes and what treasurers should know. As you can hear, it's a great and exciting program. Therefore, let's start with the BNP Paribas and Bruno Melado, who will explain how to enhance working capital, which is a clear issue for treasurers in a post-COVID period, and means to achieve such an objective. Then uh, he will talk about B2B payment and innovation. Bruno, the floor is yours. Hello, I'm Bruno Mellado from BNP Paribas. I'm responsible for payments and receivables in the Cash Management Competence Center based in Brussels. And I've been working with corporates uh, across uh, Europe and uh, Asia, US, on how to actually um, help them in working capital. And so we wrote this article in Atel about uh, how uh, changes in the uh, ecosystem are actually helping you to focus on how to improve working capital in your organization. And uh, today, what I will share with you is some of the major changes that I see that may require you to open up the process uh, from procure to pay or order to cash and see which opportunities may be there for you to improve uh, your working capital and that of your suppliers or your customers. One of the first things, of course, after going through this health crisis is to um, notice that some industries, and it really depends on the industries, have had to look closer at the health of the working capital of their suppliers or their clients. Uh, it is, uh, in a way, responsible to make sure that your suppliers can still um, deal with the inventory production required, even with payment terms that may be sometimes 60, 90 days. Of course, it depends on the industry. So uh, what we've seen is the need to uh, look for financing and to look for uh, ways to uh, simplify the uh, payment terms, uh, payment delays, uh, or to as well look at how to you increase your working capital by sometimes getting some financing that does not uh, impact your, your balance sheet uh, uh, debt uh, the KPIs. A second uh, major change is probably the arrival of e-invoicing. Uh, this is the ability to send and receive invoices electronically. This is not about a PDF, this is about structured data that will be required by governments to feed their systems, probably most likely to keep track of VAT taxes and to keep track of taxes, that's, that we know that's, that's the name of the game. This is not new in some areas of the world, uh, India, Mexico, Brazil, uh, have already implemented these type of systems for some time. Uh, Finland has been a, a pioneer in Europe, but in the rest of Europe, this is now a new uh, item in the agenda of uh, European governments. We've seen Italy already imposing a, a e-invoicing uh, system that feeds the government automatically. France will come in 2023, and we know that Spain, Portugal and other countries are looking as to how to uh, introduce that as a mandatory requirement. 
it may look like a, a hassle because you will have to make changes to the way you do your business, but in fact, it opens as well opportunities as data is digitally available and facilitates the processing of your uh, invoices out or your reception of e invoices. The third uh, change which is linked to that is the arrival of request to pay in Europe. And this is something that some of you know well, some others may not know well, but this is a scheme that will allow across Europe to uh, send a request for payment. And what this does is it gives you control on when you send an invoice that you request the payment as well and you're in control of when you will get, get paid. If you think about Riba in Italy, it's a bit the same scheme except that it will be European. And uh, we at BNP Paribas are working together with other banks, with SWIFT, to come up with the same scheme at international level, which will be very helpful at the same time in cross-country requests for payment from suppliers. Uh, so these three changes, I think, warrant to open up the process of procure to pay and order to cash and see how this can benefit you in the future. Now, to be a bit more specific about the process, uh, what I often see by discussing with treasurers is that um, depending on the industry, depending on the corporate, sometimes they are very close to the marketing department, to the ones setting up the direct sales policies or uh, managing the client uh, means of uh, collecting from clients. Some others are far away um, same for procurement. Sometimes they are very close to the procurement department, which, man which manages the purchase orders and the requisitions. Sometimes they're very far. And what actually uh, is required is that you look at this process end to end. For example, uh, those that are requiring new equipment uh, or new supplies, uh, which can be sometimes, uh, depending on the industry, 6,000 suppliers or 12,000 suppliers for telecoms and and airplane uh, manufacturers, uh, basically it requires you to um, make sure that the person who validates what you buy approves when the goods are received. And that information needs to be well integrated into the way that you instruct your payments. You need to make sure that the invoices you receive are correct, that it's, uh, it's, it's aligned with the merchandise, but as well that you keep payment terms uh, met, that you don't incur in penalties, and uh, that means that your procurement process has to be better integrated with your payment and treasury processes. Many of the software companies providing procurement systems somewhat integrate, but not yet well with your ERP systems and with the payment uh, systems. Uh, that's an area that needs improvement and request to pay e-invoicing will allow you to make that a bit more uh, seamless uh, safe, uh, avoid fraud, uh, reduce errors, and it will allow you probably to do better financing uh, to delay payment to your suppliers. You want to pay as late as possible, but you can bring some financing into the picture. Same thing when you're actually sending out invoices. You want to be in control on when you're going to get paid. That requires you to uh, send the electronic invoice, uh, ask your customer for payment, and you could use that information as well to better reconcile. The moment you send the request to pay and the invoice, you have a reference that allows you for complete uh, reconciliation end to end. And we know that when you uh, are receiving payments, it takes sometimes about two, up to two days to figure out who paid you, which department, so that you can send uh, merchandise again. That's a fact. And what we see when we see reconciliation rates uh, across corporates, uh, we tend to be around the 50, 60 uh, percent maximum of uh, straight through reconciliation. And uh, this can certainly be improved. Uh, solutions are out there in the market and, and we work with some partners which are able to combine uh, your bank statements, your invoices, even your email exchanges and be able to come to that uh, 90 percent reconciliation rate. And uh, as you know, if, if you have not reconciled, you may not be able to actually dispose of those funds because you don't know who has actually paid you uh, or that you can allow for new orders to go to that client. So there's a few pain points along this process, mostly by the lack of integration between uh, procurement marketing with the treasury. Uh, 
And probably there is uh, better working capital KPIs by uh, trying to use uh, digital information and uh, better connectivity in that, in that process. That's at least what I see that uh, there is room for improvement. Now, to put it a bit more in, in, uh, in context, uh, I'll, I'll show you just a very uh, simple picture of where are these innovations coming in in the process. So uh, when you have an, uh, clients on the left, you're the treasurer, you have suppliers on the right, payments are coming in and coming out. Um, the first change, number one, is the electronic invoicing. If you get structured data, it's going to be uh, mandatory 14 to 15 uh, standard characters. You will be able to know uh, who is asking you for your invoice, that the account is valid, uh, the amount, the tax aspect. So you will be able to take that information and you should be expecting that this is integrated into your ERP and integrated into your banking systems to format those payments. So don't need to receive a document and translate into a payment. That should be orchestrated seamlessly, uh, it should be possible. Uh, on the second item is, of course, the ability to create the request to pay and to be able to orchestrate that I request you to pay. And, uh, and that request can as well lead to different payment methods. And the intelligence on the data that you have may be able to say, from those customers, I will give them uh, these payment options, which uh, are more uh, cost efficient, are more transparent, are faster, it depends on what you're actually looking for. And so there's a knowledge and a, an intelligence that it's possible in Treasury with data to create uh, payment option selections. Uh, same thing when, when paying out, is when you pay out, you don't have to worry, do I pay via a SWIFT message or a SEPA payment, or Visa and MasterCard are proposing us new payment methods you should be able to consult that intelligence that may be provided by your bank and say, okay, the best option to pay is X, Y, or Z, depending on uh, the cost you want to incur, the certainty, the speed, and the error-free uh, uh, aspects that you want to cover. Um, the third aspect, as we discussed, is reconciliation. Uh, tools out there can be used as a service, meaning you don't have to necessarily implement them completely into your uh, treasury. You could be using these services uh, for a fee on the number of uh, lines matched, for example, and that allows you to increase that STP rate that we talked about for uh, hitting your KPIs uh, faster on, on day sales outstanding, for example. And uh, on all of that, what still remains probably a, a, a major question, and that's number four, is how am I going to reach all these uh, clients and the suppliers to yourself uh, through which network? When we send a payment, international payment, we use a SWIFT network. We know we will find the counterparty in the SWIFT network. Well, the same thing will apply for e-invoicing is how am I going to reach my counterparty electronically? And here, what we see today is the uh, creation of new networks, networks, local networks, uh, European networks like PayPal, uh, government-led networks, uh, private networks. And so um, what we believe is that uh, there will have to be a role for probably uh, companies like us, but could be others, to create networks of networks that allows you to not have to worry about where am I going to reach my client, but that you will be able to find what's the best route to send them an electronic invoice, a request to pay, and have the information timely. Uh, last but not least is that payment uh, options. Uh, what we see in the market is that uh, number of payment options just keeps increasing. Uh, we tended to think, well, there's local payments or SEPA European payments, there's international payments, there's card payments, but now we have fintech payments, uh, PayPal or, or, uh, or new, new fintechs in the, in the market, uh, MasterCard, Visa. And uh, what we see is a plethora of payment options that are available and they all have different uh, qualities, uh, the cost, the speed, certainty, guarantees. And what we believe is that uh, this complexity will have to be simplified for you as a treasurer with uh, intelligence data that will be 
consulted and it will tell you this payment, best option is that route. And that's going to happen probably between now and 24, 25. Uh, thanks to the arrival of uh, new uh, API services uh, with SWIFT, with uh, European uh, SEPA payments, but as well with third parties. And the idea in a nutshell will be that before you send your payment, you know uh, when it's going to get there, uh, how much it's going to cost, uh, whether there is a, a missing data that you will be asked later on, so you might as well provide it already, or actually uh, knowing if the currency in which you're paying is, is, has a new requirement. So that will change the way that we think about sending a payment that we don't know if it's gonna succeed to thinking, I will know up front that I'm gonna send a successful payment and I know the account to which I'm sending it. And that, that is very much in the grasp of the uh, technology, the industry, the uh, interest of all the parties to find faster ways to pay and get paid. And so all these changes, we will see them. But you can see that when you look at these five or six uh, changes, it's warranted to open up your order to cash or procure to pay processes with your partners, the marketing department, the procurement department, and look at those areas where you're having important pain points, uh, not efficient working capital, or opportunities for improving the working capital, and uh, put the finger where things will change that can make things better. Uh, of course, uh, uh, BNP Paribas uh, has experience to help you to do that analysis, find the right spots, uh, but we know that solutions will have to be uh, transversal, uh, open, and, uh, and so there's probably not one bank that can do all, but the bank probably has uh, a lot of information to help you uh, put the finger in those things that will change and that can bring you a lot of uh, improvements in your working capital. So that's in a nutshell the message I want to give you today. Uh, I will be available, uh, my email, my name. Uh, you can reach me if you have any questions or want to take the discussion further. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno, for this inspiring presentation. Now let's move to the second topic. With bearing point, Elise Grazini and Erwin Temerman, senior consultants, we will, uh, who will talk about SRTP. We all know and saw increase of frauds and cyber risk during this lockdown period. Security in Treasury and around payment is crucial. It is therefore important to address these security issues and how by standardization and internal control reinforcement to mitigate cyber risk. Elise, Erwin, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks for watching this video from Bearing Point. My name is Elise Grazini and I'm manager at Bearing Point Luxembourg. Hello, my name is Herrick Temmerman and I am a partner of Bearing Point Luxembourg. In case you do not know Bearing Point, Bearing Point is an independent management and technology consulting company with more than 4,500 employees. Herrick, today we want to present the SEPA request to pay. You say everyone wins using SEPA request to pay. Why is that so? Yes, I call SEPA request to pay a triple win. But before we come to that, more generally speaking, SEPA request to pay is an important because today customers expect that everything happens instantly, frictionless and conveniently. SEPA request to pay is a service that meets this expectation by simplifying the invoice and payment process. It is the missing link between invoices and payments. It is a messaging service where the beneficiary sends a request for a payment initiation to the payer. The message can also contain a link to the invoice. Okay, I see. Thus, when I, for example, want to buy something in a shop and choose to pay directly from account to account, the vendor sends in real time a, re a SEPA request to pay to my bank, including the details of my purchase. I almost instantly see uh, the payment details on my mobile banking app and authorize the transaction. The merchant gets the immediate feedback and releases the products I want to buy. My bank and the seller's bank can clear the payment instantly. That is exactly what a request to pay does, Elise. Okay, yes. 
And now I also see why you call, call it a triple win. Yes, CIFI request is a triple win. It is a proposition for uh, buyers, sellers and banks. This new and unique process for invoice and payment processing offers the buyer an immediate and easy access to invoices in one place. Payments can be made with a single click. The customer can decide to buy immediately or at a later time. The consolidated view of all invoices and payments in one place facilitates, for example, financial planning and tax declaration. For the seller, SEPA request to pay offers a full end-to-end -end digitization of payments and invoicing with easy follow-up to the payment process and automated reconciliation. The SEPA request to pay link can be used in any channel and thus increases the number of potential points of sale. If the provider of the channel has the buyer's contact details, a click by the buyer will be sufficient to access the invoice and payment details in his web or mobile payment application and immediately pay the purchase. Thanks to SEPA request to pay, banks can build a stronger relationship with the clients and offer additional services. With SEPA request to pay, banks are putting the account of the customer in the middle of the customer's life. But at least, as with many things in life, there are not only advantages, there are also challenges. Indeed. The payer must, for example, give this consent to receive the invoice via SEPA request to pay. Optionally, the payer may set up a whitelist. For banks, there is a security challenge. It must be assured that the messages do not contain hacked or virus contamined data. But for every challenge, there is also a solution. Yes, in order to meet um, these challenges, Bearing Point has developed a new uh, Bearing Point Build service. The service acts as a hub and provides a trusted repository for e-invoices. This solves the problem for banks of having to process data from third parties in their own systems and make it possible to present e-invoices to payers across banks. Via this service, Buying Point makes it easier for banks to connect corporates to the SEPA request to pay service. In summary, Bearing Point Bill offers four core services. Firstly, it offers security management which enables banks to uh, securely attach uh, the invoice information to the SEPA request to pay. It secures the payment messages, the invoice information and the URLs and check for malware and fraud attacks. Secondly, it offers invoice presentment. It allows consumer and corporates the functionality of receiving, viewing and managing their invoices in one place. It increases the transparency of paying bills and connects to the payment function in the online mobile banking app. Thirdly, it offers consent uh, management. It allows easy registering of consumer and corporates who want to receive invoices via request to pay. It provides a whitelisting of corporate from who you want to receive invoices in your online mobile banking app. Firstly, it offers corporate registry. It consolidates the uh, participating corporates across all banks who are uh, partners in the request to pay service. And as such, provide the basis for the whitelisting of um, consumers and corporates who, who want to receive invoices via request to pay. Great. So as a neutral party, BringPoint can thus process incoming e-invoices, including SEPA request to pay information from corporates and ensure the trustworthiness of SEPA request to pay generating partners. In this way, we solve the problem for banks of having to process data from third parties in their own systems and make it possible to present e-invoices to payers and payees across banks. In short, Bearing Point builds and does the complexity for you in the back end while everyone can benefit uh, from SEPA request to pay in a simple and frictionless way on the front end. Following video is available on our website, summarizes the benefits of SEPA request to pay and Bearing Point Bill.
The future of the bill is now. Bearing Point Bill transforms your billing and payment process, bringing the request to pay, invoice, consumer payment, and archive all together in a fully digitalized end-to-end -end process. Request to Pay is an innovative service designed by European banks. Developed in harmony, Bearing Point Bill unifies and simplifies everything. So now you can send an electronic invoice and request to pay straight to the consumer's online bank. They can open, check and pay right now if they want to or save until later. And it works for businesses too, enabling simple payments with a single click, leaving them free to get on with the job. And now you can track every bill along its journey with full transparency at every step, all automatically reconciled and archived with industry-leading security, fully aligned with the latest banking systems and standards, eliminating manual process, saving time, improving efficiency, and significantly reducing the cost of every invoice, while making life easier for your customers with simple one-click payment right now. The future of your bill is Bearing Point Bill. Find out more at bearingpointbill.com. Thanks for watching this video and feel free to contact us in case you would like to discuss this further. Thanks to both for this technical but highly important issue we need to consider. Now let's move to the panel session organized by JP Morgan about diversity in Treasury and what it means in Luxembourg, and then to another important issue, ESG and the last developments. We know that ESG is a key concern in finance in Luxembourg and one of our government priorities. Véronique Stenier, head of EMEA High Growth Tech All Sales Services at JP Morgan, will moderate this session and will introduce our uh, four panelists, Winky Shaw from Amazon, Maureen Baker from ArcelorMittal, Coralie Billman from PayPal, and Rafaela Cova de Lima uh, from Koch. Ladies, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to all and welcome to our Women in Treasury panel. We'll be discussing today about the evolution that has happened over the last year for our teams, our companies, us as women and managers. How did we cope with technology, crisis management, and of course, share lessons learned? I'm delighted to be moderating this inspiring panel. My name is Veronique Steiner, and I head up the high growth tech wholesale payment segment for JP Morgan across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. To talk through this topic, we have, of course, reached out to our three amazing panelists from last year. Corali Bilman, Head of Treasury for PayPal Europe, Rafaela Cova de Lima, EMEA Treasury Director at Coke Industries, Winky Choi, Head of Amazon EMEA Treasury. And I'm thrilled to also introduce to you our first panelist, new to this year, Maureen Baker, Global Head of Founding and Capital Markets, ArcelorMittal. So, ladies, let me start off with a few icebreaker questions. Maureen, you have a very busy day as general manager of ArcelorMittal. What do you switch off? What do you do when you switch off from work? Um, well, I, uh, I do a lot of sport, actually. Um, I, you know, whenever I can find the time, I do a lot of sports. I do yoga. I do Pilates. I love the arts. I love ballet, opera, and I also love to cook. Nice. I'd love to have some of your cooking classes. Uh, Rafaela, as a Brazilian based in Luxembourg, what is your favorite food to eat? Uh, I really like a Brazilian uh, snack that we have. You can eat it through uh, breakfast or throughout the day. It's called pão de queijo. It's like cheese buns made of cheese and tapioca flour. It's very easy to make and you can also find it in supermarkets here. So you can bake it yourself at home. Makes me want to try it. Thank you, Rafaela. Corali, moving on to you. Where is your favorite place to travel? 
Um, I always still do the or make the same um, answer as last year, to be honest, because I went this year again. I always uh, go to Krita, south of Krita, a little village called Myrtos. It's just a little paradise, to be honest. The people are really nice. They recognize us, try to uh, learn a few words of Greek all the time. And uh, it's really good for uh, swimming and absolutely disconnect. The Wi-Fi is really poor, so you cannot <laughs> walk from there, and it's just like pure disconnection and pure, um, you know, harmony with the nature. Thanks, Kavali. And Winky, on your side, how do you manage such a busy job and carving out some personal time? So I have a secret sauce. <laughs> it's uh, try to identify flexibility whenever you can with your schedule. Try to manage expectations and delegate. And by delegating to others that you free up yourself some time to do what you need to do. You know, mental health is more important than ever, um, ever since the pandemic. So I think we all need to take care of ourselves one way or the other. Thank you, ladies. So hopping on to our topic of today. The pandemic has had a huge impact around the world and around the globe. Uh, treasurers and financial officers have had a key role as they supported their organizations through unprecedented times. It would be great to hear from you about your experience over the last 12 months, but personally, but also throughout your organization. And let me start over with you, Maureen. Right, so initially it was a very difficult period. Of course, um, it was an unprecedented crisis, as you know, and so we didn't really have any idea in terms of the um, quantum of the uh, crisis or the duration of the crisis. And so we put in liquidity lines, um, we did a capital raise. There were some divestments. Um, in hindsight, we didn't need at all the liquidity uh, lines because we had exceptionally strong liquidity. But again, we just didn't know. Okay, so as a result, honestly, we have come out much stronger um, as a much stronger company um, as a result. Um, and then looking at the last 12 months, um, I can't say it's gotten that much easier. The second half of 2020, it's much easier for us as a company, but the second half of 2020 was the busiest that I have been. I mean, just many, many, many projects. And then, of course, working from home, you know, and not being able to travel to see your colleagues, it just gets old. Agreed. Not always easy. Um, so thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, moving on to you, Rafaela, how has it been these last 12 months? Well, personally, it was a lot, right? I was just moving back from the United States to a new role, new team, new stakeholders and everything. So a lot was changing in 12 months. And then taking the pandemic period also was a huge challenge for me. I was moving from the office environment to home working. I had a, I really struggled with, uh, with the, trying to disconnect everything and separate work from personal life was, uh, was a challenge for me. And for the organization, like my, my company was going through one of the biggest business transformation processes in the treasury uh, in history for the company. So it was a lot and we had to take care of everyone and make sure that the teams were, were also uh, capable of, of giving their potential. Thanks very much, Rafaela. Uh, Cor Coralie, can you also share with us your experience? Yeah, of course, for, for PayPal, it was really challenging because the, the volumes uh, were much higher than, uh, than before. So we are really uh, face a, a growth in the volumes and in the, the you know, almost the questions from every stakeholder. So we had, um, you know, to play on really numerous um, tasks all the time. And personally, it was uh, extremely challenging as well with kids at home. So you have to do the homeschooling. So for um, working moms, it was even more, I would say, challenging than before. Uh, but again, uh, everything um, is, um, I would say, we, 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 we exit this with a stronger position in, uh, in both sides, I would say, personally and at the office as well. Uh, because um, again, we, we run a payment company uh, without uh, anyone at um, office space and still not the case at the moment. So everything has to be smooth, 100% smooth all the time without any defect. And this is where like the success is and it's um, really proud of uh, the company and all the people uh, delivering this, uh, this high expectation. Thanks, Coralie. Maybe, Rafaela, coming back to you, so we were sharing on, uh, on you, your company, but you were also talking about, you know, your team. 
Um, could you share a little bit more around, you know, how you have supported your teams? Uh, I know for every manager, the importance was of looking after our teams during this crisis. It has been, you know, top priority for me, like I'm sure with you. Um, how did you cope with items like, you know, fostering internal networks while working remotely or ensuring good work and life balance uh, to avoid any burnout? So maybe, Rafael, if you can maybe talk a little more on that, please. Yeah, no, definitely. So my team is very diverse. We come from very different backgrounds. And of course, there was a, it was very hard to have one solution uh, fits all, kind of. And uh, we really have to take into account like the team's workload and their also individual kind of personal situation. So we had team members that had to homeschool their kids, like Coralie was saying, or uh, they, they were just completely stranded from their families as well. And that can take an emotional tool. So we were trying to connect all the time, try to understand the workload of the groups and try to understand how people were feeling and adapt to the situation as we went. Uh, we, we managed to accomplish a lot, especially taking that we were going through this huge business transition as well and without, uh, without any disruption. So yeah, I think it was, it was a success, but definitely I, we could have probably managed to do much more if we weren't in a pandemic crisis. Thanks. And Kohali, on your side, anything you'd like to add that you've done also differently or in the same way? What we really try to do is like to catch up one-to-one um, -one with uh, some of the team members uh, because definitely um, need to keep the, the connection on the informal side. Um, otherwise, uh, with uh, teams meetings all day long, you lose the... Uh, um, you know, the coffee connection, I would say, we had at, um, at the office. So it's really key to still uh, keep the, the door open for any, uh, you know, feedback from people working uh, for us or w when we work for others. It's, it's really key to really set up a few, a few times, it could be like just 15 minute slot uh, to reinteract uh, each other on an informal basis. It's really key that people can be free to talk uh, to each other. So I give an example what we do like every two weeks. We try to do a APAC EMEA friendly uh, coffee virtual chat where we basically uh, pick some of uh, one subject could be like, um, you know, specialties or cooking specialty from one country or could be someone presenting some old photos. We had a, a colleague presenting, uh, you know, when he was uh, playing concerts or musicals in, uh, you know, 20 or even 20 years ago. So we really try to pick an icebreaker subject and interact uh, to each other. It's really key. It seemed like a lot of fun, uh, and I think it's indeed great to have people, you know, uh, share more, you know, personally what they do, what they love, and I think we learn a lot more, and we work, you know, very differently then. So moving on to the third question, um, I'd like to know what does working from home mean in your industry? So this question is, I'd like to have, you know, Maureen give us maybe her feedback because she's from a steel company, which I'm sure is very different to when Kohali is living in from a perspective of a you no know, tech company. Um, so ladies, uh, Maureen, maybe starting off with you. Yes, certainly. So obviously, food people working in the sites, whether it be steel, mining, um, working from home is far more challenging. And there may have been some disruptions from time to time. And just comparing that to um, our own experience, you know, from the corporate office, it was very smooth, very efficient, and it actually surprised people in terms of how easy it really was to work from home and execute large transactions from home. We even heard that, you know, some of the banks had issues. We have a very large treasury and everything ran very smoothly here. Um, back to the sites um, in our largest new acquisition, um, in Hazira in India, we actually converted right next to our site. We set up a, a COVID care hospital where we had oxygen, a continuous sub supply of oxygen going to um, a, a set up hospital just for COVID that started out as 250 beds and was going up to um, a thousand beds. Um, so it's just a very interesting um, example of, um, you know, of uh, what a, a site did. And I would just add one last comment because I think it's important because we do talk about the difference between industry and industry. And of course, people have such personal situations that are so different too. 
because for me, it was so easy working from home. It was very efficient, very easy. And my close colleague who lives around the corner from me, um, he had a wife working from home. He had two daughters at home. Um, he had a pet at home. He was working out of the kitchen. And, you know, people were coming in, you know, wanting to make a sandwich for lunch. And he was on Zoom calls and in, in meetings, et cetera. So everyone had a very different situation. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, Karali, what about you? Um, for us, I would say it's really the new normal, and it's really, um, I think it's becoming the new normal. Um, it's really uh, smooth. Um, we uh, really adjusted very quickly to the new environment, and I think it's really due to, to the, the core business of the company. Definitely everything is uh, in payments or digital already. So the, um, you know, the uh, transpose was pretty smooth. Um, I would say the, really the most uh, question I had was more on the uh, settlement of uh, the trading side, which um, had to be like, again, 0% defect. So you, when you think about operating, you know, billions of trades uh, a day without anyone at the office, it was really a great, I would say, challenge uh, to operate without any, any issue with, uh, with this side. Um, but yeah, I think now for the moment we are still very um, happy and performant uh, in this environment. And uh, now we're expecting to have some offices uh, reopening at some point, and we hope, uh, more as a collaborative hub, um, because again, nothing can really replace uh, you know, physical interaction, or it's, it's still challenging. So we hope to see our colleagues again, we hope to organize uh, meetings or workshops at some point, but for the moment, again, it's really performing very well. And uh, people save a lot of time on the commute as well, especially in our headquarters in, uh, in San Jose. Uh, to commute to and from the office, it was sometimes more than an hour one way. So this, um, you know, a lot of people are really taking this time to, um, you know, enjoy the family time or sports. So it's really key as well. And I think people are performing better because of this, um, you know, new time during their days as well. Thanks, Kohali. And I, I completely understand like the collaborative approach, right? We've at JP Morgan, we've reopened most of our offices uh, now, not not fully, but I do think that you know having the 3D instead of the 2D does feel good in terms of of being there and being able to share also not only Zoom but also being able to have a lunch or things like that with the colleagues. I think is very valuable. Um, so maybe moving on to a question that I hope will you know help our young women in, in the industry. Uh, Raphael, could you share with us advices for young women in the industry who do, um, due to the pandemic, have perhaps not had the opportunity to be visible as they should have been, meeting, you know, in person? Um, what do you think they should be doing? Because, you know, in certain industry, this is will continue to be as virtual as it is today. No, definitely. I, I would say, first of all, don't see that as a real challenge, but more a, an obstacle to be overcome. Uh, one of the items that uh, I always try to even tell to my younger uh, team members is just to go the extra mile, right? Like instead of uh, sending an email uh, to someone, just giving someone a quick call uh, and that saves the number of emails majority of the time, but also improves or increases your uh, your time with the person or how, how the person captures you and the same with meetings right like when you are in meetings nowadays that everything is virtual a lot of the body language is part of the communication is missed and i think like having the camera on you can perceive how people are seeing you but also how how you are how people are getting the message from you or how you are receiving the message and you can adapt your communication style to the audience that you are you are providing so i think it goes uh, long ways having the camera on we we have a, uh, we have realized that uh, in the company with time and definitely always looking forward to meet face to face right like it's something that it, it's still it's still worth it but it might just take some more time uh, Winky coming to you any other tips you'd like to share with these young women um, sure. I, I think I totally agree with what Rafael has said. Um, you know, be more engaged. And more engagement also means um, in a different area such as be engaged in a virtual environment where maybe you used to attend meetings and now it's okay to go on virtually. 
Um, and engagement in this case would be maybe asking good questions, the quality questions. Um, that way you help to build a connection on the other side as well. Um, it is definitely, as Coralie said, this is a new normal. So we just need to find a new way to still be able to social and make connection um, with the other professionals in the industry. Thanks. Very insightful. Thanks, Winky. Um, so moving on another topic, which is ESG. So more, most of our organization now have ESG policies. Um, I'd love to know how you are applying ESG in Treasury. Uh, from the programs your company run, are there, you know, one that strike particularly uh, yourself, given this is a woman in treasury panel, of course, but, you know, that are significant to women, do you think? And uh, maybe I can uh, start off with Rafaela and then move on to Coralie. No, definitely. Um, I think, like, diversity is something that we should all embrace. And um, Coke doesn't have a specific quotas or, or trying to do that. My team is around seven to nine different nationalities. And um, Coke has a corporate culture that's called market-based management. And the idea there is that we seek and try to embrace different perspectives, different experiences, different aptitudes, knowledge, and skills and backgrounds. Because if we all look the same, spoke the same, had the same experience, had the same backgrounds, not much innovation or collaboration would happen, right? So the way that we create value is by having different people thinking differently. And that allows for better teamwork and therefore being successful in the long term. Thanks. Uh, Coralie, moving on to you. Sure. Um, yeah, definitely diversity should be like an asset and uh, something like we look for. And uh, we should all um, kind of uh, try to target diversity. But to, to, in order to do so, it has to be informal again. It has to be like you cannot like force people to interact each other if they don't have the, uh, you know, the, really the, uh, the ambition or the, uh, the, the really envy to do so. So um, a nice tips, for example, is like when you create like a challenge where people from different countries or different backgrounds will all compete for or go for the same target. I take the example of a very easy one and very, uh, you know, common, the walking challenge with the steps that you count on your phone on a, it could take a month but what what we did was was kind of fun because we had some teams so the teams had absolutely a chance so you can um, everywhere for um, from all the all around the, the globe were picked basically and then people were sending pictures of their works so you can see some absolutely fabulous landscapes from everywhere in Singapore or in, uh, in San Jose or everywhere. So people try to really uh, share their uh, experience with each other. And you, you create some bonds which are different from like team uh, or even, um, you know, absolutely different subjects. You can have uh, a new friend who is working in IT and the other side of the world. So I would say diversity is like, should be encouraged by the company and then just stimulate it. But everything else is with the people. So it's a lot with the culture of the people to really embrace diversity and really enjoy it. Uh, but we all um, you know, exit from, in, uh, from there with uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, growth potential as well. Uh, it, it gives a lot of uh, people to, um, to have dif diversity in their lives as well. I love the embracing diversity. Thank you. Uh, Winky, what would you say is your best tip or trick of advice for others when thinking about building great teams and incorporating this device to inclusion and cultural considerations? Building and maintaining a great team, I think, requires the engagement. Um, you're able to motivate them and feel, make them feel like they are very much connected. And it's regardless whether you're thinking diversity or not, it's just that's a team. But obviously, when you start wanting to focus on a diversity in, and inclusiveness, we need to think about having a platform that allow them to speak for themselves, that to be who they are. Um, so the way I have seen, or at least that I, I deploy <laughs> my, my world, is that we create a lot of, right now after the pandemic, things are much harder, obviously. It's not like you can sit in a water cooler and can chit chat and kind of build a relationship that way anymore. So we have an online 
chat room. It's just within the team. You can say whatever you want. You can ask any question you want. Everybody's on that, and you can engage as you need. Or if you're busy, then you can just um, disregard it. Um, and then, we, of course, we. I also have the one-on-ones. Um, one-on-ones, as Coralie mentioned, it's very important. This is very personal. This is above and beyond the work. This is about the time that you want to get to know the other person. And oftentimes, when you start talking about work, it kind of change the topic into the personal life, the challenge that they're facing. Why couldn't they deliver? And you will learn about what they're struggling, and you have a better empathy. And with that, you will earn their trust because now they understand you're trying to help them to succeed, whether giving more flexibility or changing the schedule or get the support that they need to help to get the work done. Um, all of that is applied just as much when you want to promote diversity and inclusiveness. Working mother or even single parent, for example, uh, would be very difficult to, to do the job that you would have expect prior to pandemic, or especially during the pandemic, because of the additional responsibility you have in a, in a family. You provide more flexibility to them. You allow them to kind of be able to juggle a little bit better. In general, they are going to be working harder for you and um, be able to deliver because they understand that you're giving them the opportunity they wouldn't have otherwise. So this kind of all works together at the end of the day. And I do think that um, be able to provide flexibility, not just in your own term, but understand what it means to the others on the other end, it's important. And I think our leadership team definitely um, really promotes that as well. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing so, so in depth your, your tips and tricks, uh, Winky. Maureen, what are yours? So um, in terms of team uh, results, and it's been mentioned, um, already, but I, I, I strongly believe that members should be rewarded for team results. So if you have the same objectives and the same goals, then you are going to be highly encouraged to work together to achieve the same objective. And as regards diversity and inclusion, I think that education is really important because study after study has shown the benefits of diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, McKinsey did a study and they found that those in the top quartile for ethnic and racial diversity in management were 35% more likely to have financial returns above their industry means. And those in the top quartile for gender diversity were more likely to have returns above their industry means. And another study that Credit Suisse did found um, in a study of 2,400 companies that organizations with at least one female board member yielded higher return on equity and higher net income growth than those that did not have any women on the board. Now, obviously, this is not just about gender diversity. This is about, um, uh, you know, gender, age, uh, race, religion, et cetera. But again, study after study has shown um, the benefits of diversity and inclusion. And I think people need to really understand that because it's been proven. Thanks, Maureen. Um, so, Winky, coming back to you, um, retaining talent has always been very complex. Uh, you were just alluding earlier that COVID pushed you know, a trend to allow more flexible work models. Do you feel it's becoming a must-have to make sure that we retain talents in our companies? Absolutely. Um, in this new normal, as now we all see it, um, it is absolutely the most important factor to be flexible. Um, Harvard Business Review actually had done uh, some assessment on you know, post-pandemic, what does that mean when it comes to work-life balance? Um, prior to the pandemic, obviously, we have this implicit ideal worker model, you know, putting all the hours in, you basically don't have time for yourself or for the family for that matter. And I think people realize that during the pandemic, their increasing responsibility in the family and the mental health really took a toll if you continue with that implicit model. And I think people have changed that. And in order to embrace that change, you have to be flexible. And again, I mentioned earlier, this flexibility doesn't necessarily mean you, know, you can work at hours. Sometimes it means something else, right? Depending on the person. And they will have, from a work perspective, you've got to understand this is no longer about quantity, but more of a quality. 
So instead of responding quicker, now you have a better response. So instead of a longer working days, you now you have a more a productive working day. Those are the things that we need to focus on is the results rather than the input. Um, at the end of the day, I think having a healthier and happier employees, um, it it's can be achieved without the flexibility. And I think that is something we've got to think about and focus on as a company and as a leaders in the, in, in the organization. And that also helps with the diversity as well, you know, coming back to that now you are able to be more inclusive, allowing more people to be able to join the workforce as a result of flexibility because you're no longer forcing them on that harsh working hours. Winky, thank you. Ladies, thank you so much. I'd like to thank ATL to having us again this year. This has been an amazing panel. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as myself. And I wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks to our five ladies for these insightful discussions. Now let's move to the next topic with bottom line and how to find treasury and linemen in trapped and untapped data. We all know that data mining and the use of uh, huge data available in treasury is a challenge for all treasurers. Looking forward to discovering tips and pieces of advice from our specialist, Tom Lage, Director of Sales and Business Development at Bottom Line. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francois, and welcome everyone to today's session on uh, looking at treasury and uh, trapped data and untapped uh, data within uh, your company. So what we're going to look at today, as we said, is looking uh, to see where we can advise customers and potential uh, users to find data within a group without having to burden large cost of new systems, or if you are starting that journey, where you are on the um, data curve uh, and looking at a number of different trends across Treasury. So starting with uh, today, uh, we can see financial professionals require comprehensive visibility into their cash and transactions, which hasn't changed. What we are seeing change uh, dramatically since the start of COVID was, of course, the adoption of new technologies, looking at forecasting to see when uh, you have to forecast. Large number of iterations have begun to happen daily rather than weekly, rather than monthly. We're seeing a large uh, number of customers still needing that single point of view. So as you can see on our market drivers and priorities, 61% of corporates still uh, need and want uh, a real-time single view of their cross-bank balances. We can also see that 39% require liquidity solutions, um, including pooling and netting. Uh, we see that increasing. Interestingly, we've seen a few market trends uh, of companies acquiring netting solutions, which I think is only going to drive that further. 50% uh, still need automation on payments uh, and reconciliation, which is a big driver we're seeing at the moment with a large number of customers wanting to get that accurate um, position and cash flow. If you think about it, obviously receivables is money in. If you think about payables is money out. Uh, and then you have the intermediary bit of reconciling and see what your positioning it is. What's sort of really pushing this uh, is we're seeing, obviously, the regulatory changes have happened over the last two years three years of PS2 coming into play, the advent and creation of what we're starting to see is like API bureaus. Uh, so those solutions that are offering easy integration to banks through APIs, uh, and also, of course, changes within the SWIFT network um, of looking at uh, Alliance Lite 2 and Alliance Cloud coming out. Uh, which we're only going to see gives opportunities to customers to have that 100% visibility. You know, when we started this, or when I started the Treasury Express, now bottom line Treasury Express, we saw a large number of customers really struggle to get that 100% view of their accounts. This is really sort of driven by cost. Of course, you may have a large structure which makes it cost prohibitive to engage with your banks at that level of daily transactions through M2940 or through PI files. What we're seeing with the API uh, functionality that banks are providing now is, of course, the driving down of costs for data, which is only good. Now, that data can come from the bank uh, through API or SFTP or through SWIFT. But 
to use it, you have to have either a system or an understanding of how those files work. And what we're seeing is when customers come through this idea and we want to look at what data we have within the group to make better insights, we try and outline four core pillars to look at. Firstly is what teams do you have around the world? What banking structure do you have? What internal systems do you need? And then also, where do you want to head? And we'll touch on that a bit later of where we can do certain action points to mean that we can utilize the data we have within the group better. So speed is, of course, uh, a huge driver right now. Um, one of our customers, Avalon Healthcare, has been forecasting prior to the uh, COVID once every two weeks, updating it, to now going through many iterations uh, daily to get that sort of position. So we're seeing that across all of the companies we're working with now is an increased uh, speed and requirement for data to be ready to different groups. Now, this is quite difficult to do if you haven't got a system. Of course, you're working on Excel and shared drives. So having a system uh, in place, and we've seen a large spike in uh, onboarding of customers earlier on during the pandemic. As people wanted that forecasting module, they wanted the ability to see all of their cash in one place. So it's actually been quite good for us in the sense that we've seen an increase in uptake of solutions because corporates need to get that insight as quick as possible. What we also see is across the group is the idea of simplicity and unification. What I mean by that is uh, more stakeholders need more data uh, and we're looking at extrapolating that data into a way that people can understand it. So we're seeing a large drive and request for simplicity of UI and UX. You know, everyone can work on Excel, but to understand the data within it can be quite difficult. So when we're looking at onboarding the systems, a lot of customers are asking us around, do you have data uh, or BI tools where we can integrate and show that it's actually meaningful? What we're also seeing across the uh, group is looking at what is insights from the ordinary. So what can your operational data tell you? So once you have the idea of integrating your banks, either through Swift, API, API Bureau, or SFTP, however it can be done, what are the benefits you can do? Now, if we're looking at, let's say, um, collaborative and proactive risk management, what we mean by that is we don't just want to integrate with the bank. We also want to integrate with any ERP or invoice system, because this is going to give us the flows we need to see, for example, around FX. So how do we do that? Uh, and I think you should start the conversation with your providers is by looking at um, what data they can absorb from these different systems. Or what can I uh, integrate from different teams on a timely manner that allow me to create this proactive risk management tool? So understanding firstly the behavior you have within the group. So do you do just spots, forward swaps on what frequency, how often do you integrate invoices? is a starting point to look at how you can be proactive with risk management. Once you have that understanding of your existing uh, setup, you can then talk to your providers or potential providers out there saying, right, this is our current existing infrastructure. This is our current existing process. I want to go to the next level of, let's say, integrating invoices into a system to give me this point of view. This is where you then start and say, right, I need to go out to that next level of what should I look out for? And our sort of message we've always been giving throughout this, to get the right level of data into a system or to understand the data that already exists in the company, you must find a provider that's willing to absorb or has the ability to transform a large array and different uh, type of files into a system to make it meaningful. That is exactly the same as predictive forecasting. You, know, you have the best Excel design in the world, but if not everyone can use it, or if you're pulling in different data from, let's say, ERPs, pulling in data from subsidiaries all around the world that may not have their banks plugged in, you have to have that data flow into a, uh, Excel either manually or most likely manually. So again, on the idea of speaking to existing relationships you have within your technology infrastructure, make sure you're talking to them and say, right, actually, is this the best uh, file format for us to integrate. You know, for example, we've seen a number of our customers change from, let's say, integrating an MT940 to actually saying we need to have an MT942 or MT900 uh, or 910 to integrate credit and debit devices, because on that credit and debit device, there's actually more detail for us to allow us to reconcile against. So then we're getting better insights into our actual position as of now, uh, because we can now see that rather than truncating, uh, let's say, a description from 100 
letters or characters down to 20, we've now seen on the 25th character, that is where maybe that invoice number is or the customer reference. Or if we're, for example, working with trading platforms in the Middle East, we know that on most of the bank files, it begins from the eighth character and is five characters long. So if we hadn't got that data from changing the file format into our system, it makes it a bit more difficult to create that predictive forecasting scenario. Once you have all the data flowing between ERP and bank in our system, which is obviously the center of the universe, you then have the ability to get a better insight into your cash, which allows you then better to strategic and, uh, or strategically manage your liquidity. So whether that be a debt portfolio or investments, uh, you can manage that whole life cycle across. So again, just to summarize, to get uh, untapped data or untrapped uh, cash out of it, what we need to look at is where did your data come from? In what format? Um, what can the system absorb? Uh, is there anything else my team can be doing to provide or enhancing that data or enriching it? You know, there's a lot of systems out there that are able to transform data. We have in bottom line, a very good transformation tool that's helping a large number of customers whilst, uh, come, well, whilst banks are transitioning to the XML format. If there's any legacy in there, we're able to help with those customers still maintain and work until that change happens with that bank. So where are customers on the trajectory to data maturity? If you look at this slide, there's four different uh, levels to it. We have what is called dependent. So no ownership, uh, no ownership of data or access. This is basically, uh, I suppose not stone ages, this is where a lot of customers currently sit. Very disparate systems, very disparate processes, no real center of the universe. So you're reliant upon others from others, uh, you're reliant upon data from others in a manual way. Now, to be fair, this is actually where a lot of customers still reside, but we're starting to see that maybe they have a system uh, centrally they're now being allowed to use, or we're seeing uh, other softwares come in and take uh, part of that workload off. And that's where we sort of move to the next one, saying access to high level or disparate data. So you may have a shared uh, Excel, you might have a cash management system that's used by head office that you're now allowing to be used. But we're seeing that more and more customers are now reside within this uh, reactive state, which is good, but it's not really where most companies want to go. They want to sort of cross over into the analytical stage, which is where you can maintain the key financial data uh, and short-term historical analysis. And, and we're seeing customers come to us and say, look, either we haven't got anything, but we realize we need to go on a transformation journey for the next eight to 10 years. Uh, we recognize we need eventually, let's say one to a hundred of activities. Uh, but the realization is that actually you need one to 20 in year one. So we're seeing now more and more customers come to us and say, we're actually starting this journey. We need to provide a provider that can not just do one to a hundred, but can do it in a stage process that fits us and is not cost prohibitive. So we're not buying 100 right now, we're buying only 20, but we need to grow into it. And that's really where we're seeing uh, companies move into the predictive side of it. Once you have an understanding of where you need to go to, you can then analyze your building blocks, which I said was obviously your internal infrastructure, your external infrastructure, your banks and your systems, and then where do you want to go at the end point? And that's really where you move into this predictive side of it and the ability to make decisions across all financial uh, touch points uh, and stages. And I can't stress enough, like when we see some customers either move from systems or go out to tender, I think one of the largest underrated uh, points to ask is how many people can I have within the system at, a, at what cost? Because we're seeing that if you're limited by budget of only having, let's say, three or four members of a team or group into a software, it makes it very difficult uh, for you to pass this data and to be pre predictive. Because if you're limiting your scope of who can use it, or you're limiting your scope of inter integrations with software, uh, that means you're only ever going to have a very um, limited take uh, on, on your data. So it's always important to say, right, if I am going to expand or if we're a company going through acquisition, what does those future acquisitions have an impact on uh, the cost of these systems? If you don't want to go and buy something that you think, great, suddenly you try and grow it and it's now cost prohibitive and there's no point in having it. So if we go on to the next point of looking at where the benefits are of a connected treasury. And as I said, connected treasury isn't just about connecting systems. It's also about connecting teams uh, and connecting insights because you can have everything connected through uh, you know, host to host API and all this data. But unless you have a team that can actually understand it or utilize it, it's not much use at all. So looking at this, we have obviously the banks at the top 
So how do we integrate with that? We've mentioned looking at potentially uh, API integrators, SFTP, Swift. Most importantly, even though you may have these all coming in, it's also the data and the format you're receiving from the banks. You question your banks of, is it the best file I can have uh, from the bank to allow me to reconcile? Again, I mentioned that we've had customers change you know, from a MT940 to a CAM file to see if there's more data within those um, lines to see if we can reconcile better. If you're looking at integrating, let's say, FX, uh, does my bank provide me a FX portal I can do seamlessly and can I manage that process of FX transactions through my software? If we're looking at hedging, is there ability to then pass those hedge trades through, let's say, a 360T or FX all that allows me to do it? Is that integrated into my software or am I looking at um, two disparate systems again? If we look at Treasury, this is where I'm really talking about more of your team. So looking at the benefit of integrating all your team members, it's not just for a centralized Treasury system, it can be also for a decentralized Treasury. So looking at this, do I have everyone on software that needs to be uh, utilizing it? If not, what can I do? Is there a certain report that I can send out to, let's say, uh, functional business heads or finance heads? Is there uh, an ability to approve payments? You know, one of the biggest drivers we're seeing, not only with forecasting at the start of the COVID pandemic, it was also now payment fraud and prevention. So, you know, it's great having a software, but again, if you're limited on who can access the system by cost, you're not really running the best payment factory or payment approval system you can. You know, we're also seeing, now a part of bottom line, integration with other products like CFRM, which allow us to look at uh, and analyze and be proactive around fraud prevention uh, within the treasury cycle. So it's not just by saying we have a four-eyed workflow principle, it's checking on who, which new beneficiaries have we added, who added them, when were they added, what was the approval process on that, running against OFAC watch list, running, running against different uh, algorithms we have in our software to see, is it going to be any different from the last two invoices we've had in from that customer? You know, if suddenly, say we're saying we're paying a hundred pounds every week, suddenly the one comes in for a hundred thousand, pounds. Looking at ERPs, again, this is a huge integration point. And we're seeing more and more customers come to us on a journey of saying, look, we're moving from five ERPs to one, but we know that's going to take roughly 18 months per ERP. So it's not a hurdle that you should really be concerned with as long as you have the right um, provider. What I mean by that, again, is the understanding that a connected treasury should be uh, not just a solid state, it is a fluid state. What I mean by that is you shouldn't start day one saying we have everything ready. Uh, if you want anything else, you have to pay for it or it's not going to happen. Treasury is fluid and so are companies and their structures and technologies they have. So the idea of creating, a, I suppose, a connected treasury, as I said, should be with the providers saying, look, here is what we can do. Here we understand your future state and where you want to go. And we will work with you to find that um, common, I suppose, point of data, cost, uh, and proactive an outcome from it. So here we have uh, the next slide looking at those four pillars, I said. So banks, system, people, and processes. So when looking at how to get data out of a bank or how to use it, you know, the points are always talk to your banks, even if you've got Excel or you've got an incumbent system or you're starting on a journey, talk to them about what um, files you can have or what new technologies are coming up or are they API ready? Because what this is going to allow you to do is if you've got a system uh, that's running, let's say, 50% of reconciling as a point again, go and talk to the banks and say, look, we've identified that we aren't the best at reconciling. Maybe it's because there are so many unknown transactions occurring within the ERP uh, that aren't being that are occurring in the bank that aren't being tracked in the ERP. So maybe you want to go back and look in the ERP and say, is there a business unit or group that have said um, they're not uploading files on a regular basis? Or maybe it's with the bank, they aren't capturing the correct level of detail within the transaction description that allows us to reconcile on. So both talk, talk to your bank and your provider saying, you know, what is there out there? What can I have uh, different to what I'm receiving now that will allow me to increase and improve my process? Systems are sometimes uh, very good at working with each other. Sometimes they're very poor at working with each other. Um, in the past, we've seen um, a lot of customers work with providers saying, you know, it's my way or the highway. You have to take this file format. We can't take any other. For me, that's a bit uh, backward and antiquated way of working. There are so many systems out there, whether it be the ERP, uh, large providers, or they'd be newer um, 
let's say, the neo banks or even newer uh, cash management systems or FX trading or hedging systems. The idea is that a treasury management system should be uh, the center of the universe and to be ordered to be that center of the universe, it has to integrate more or less any file type that the customers have. Now, obviously, there are some, some limits to that saying, you know, PDF can't be uploaded. Maybe you're looking at then creating a CSV that can be mapped into the software. So the importance of having that focal point of a treasury system that can adopt and absorb any file format is extremely important because it then just means that everything resides in that software. We can also say that if your system is um, going to be with you for the next 10 years, look at where you want to go and say, right, on your product development, do you have, let's say, blockchain? Is that going to be something you're looking at? Or are we looking at um, algorithms and AI? Are we looking at machine learning? The system you work with should be able to tell you where they are on the product roadmap and what's coming up. And you should be able to also influence that. What you don't want to have is a provider that's not looking at uh, updating, let's say, every six months, or it's only doing yearly releases you're paid for. Those times are sort of behind us. What we are now looking for is a continually evolving software that can take uh, clients' requests and ideas with them on their product roadmap and publish it and show them what they're doing. Because that will give you sense of mind and also understanding of where the company is going or where your partner is going. So you can then talk to, again, your banks, seeing, look, my provider is going on this trajectory. Do you have the ability to provide it? If not, is it going to disrupt my process and my outcome of data? Same with people. You know, when looking at teams, people are the most important thing. Treasury technology is never going to replace an individual. It's only going to empower that individual to make more strategic points of view. But the people you have are saying, are they able to share data? Let's say even just on Excel, if you haven't got a system. Where are they sharing that data to? What data are they sharing to me? Can everyone understand it? What the idea is, once you've got a system in place, is to empower those people, as I mentioned, to be able to view the data in a certain way that allows them to be more strategic, whether that be a higher frequency of forecasting that goes centrally for them to then ask for funds more more proactively and more accurately, or whether it becomes down to people looking at us as a fraud or payments, say, is there something that we can do to prevent any loss or hold up uh, with those um, actions? And then process. The process idea is an understanding of where you are now, where you want to be, but also where you want to go. Uh, we've done a few sessions with a, a number of consultancies over this year talking through that understanding of where we are now, understanding of where we want to go to, uh, and understanding of beyond that. And that's very important because that will also empower, as I mentioned, the three pillars above. So where your people are. So give them hope of, look, we understand there are issues currently within this process. Uh, we understand that uh, to provide the data we need, it's extremely time consuming. So what we're going to do is going to get a system to help with that. Uh, and understanding again with a roadmap of where that is going and where that can provide insight to your people. And then ultimately, everyone has a bank, so they're the sort of core of this. Working with your banking providers to understand where you can get data from, what format the data can come in, is all very important. And ultimately, it's down to the corporate to find the best provider for you. It's not always the biggest. It's not always the smallest. You want to find a provider that sits across uh, your uh, company, has an understanding of how you work as a team, has the ability to work and direct you and also you direct them to see where they should sit onto it. Because ultimately, without the correct provider, you can have all the data in the world, uh, but never have an ability to understand it or utilize it in a correct way. So that's uh, today. And if you do have any questions, please do look at uh, the contact details below to look at um, myself and contact bottom line of how we can help around collecting data and understanding it for Treasury and your strategic purposes. Thanks, Tom, for this presentation, which is necessary to consider to make use and a better use of existing data, a challenging exercise for treasurers. Now let's move to our next speakers, Daniela Ockelman and Oana Popescu from EY Taxes, to talk about the next new wave of international tax changes and what it means for corporate treasurers. Ladies, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Welcome to our presentation on the next wave of international tax changes and what treasurers should know about it. With me is Oana Popescu, Senior Manager in the Transit Pricing Team at EY Luxembourg. 
I'm Daniela Hockelmann, Associate Partner in our Luxembourg International Tax Practice. There will be changes to the international tax rules which will fundamentally reshape the international tax system and which shall affect every taxpayer within their scope. Therefore, a revolution of international taxation lies ahead of us. In the next 20 minutes, we'll give you a brief overview of some of the most important developments at the OECD and EU level. Many of these developments will also be relevant for companies performing financing and treasury activities in Luxembourg. Let's take a quick look back. The past decade has seen changes and a clear direction already towards the upcoming revolution. In view of the financial crisis of 2008 to 2010, many countries decided that the rules which were developed over the last century must be amended. The G20 requested the OECD to start redrafting the basic rules of international taxation. What came out of this request was the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, or short BEPS project. As part of this project, over the years 2013 to 15, there were 15 actions designed to counter the ability of multinationals to engage in BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting. In the following years, the BEPS actions led to significant changes also in Europe, such as the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, or short ATAD 1 or ATAD 2. On the other hand, on some issues, no consensus was reached. Most prominently, there was no consensus on how to address the digital economy. A number of countries started to adopt unilateral measures. As a response to these developments, the G20 and the OECD in 2018 began their work on what is called BEPS 2.0. In the next few minutes, we'll provide an overview of what BEPS 2.0 is going to bring. We'll also look at what the European Commission refers to as business taxation of the 21st century. What is that? Um, well, in May this year, the European Commission specified its quite ambitious tax agenda for the years to come. As part of that, we'll first take a look at uh, envisaged EU rules to neutralize the use of the misuse of shell entities for tax purposes. That is referred to as ATAD 3. Secondly, we'll speak about the targeted creation of a so-called debt equity bias reduction allowance or short DEBRA. To kick it off, let me show you this timeline. You'll see, what we are talking about is not a distant music of the future, but we expect to see important further developments and details over the next few months. You see on the left side, ATAD 1 and 2, with those measures already implemented in life since 2019 and 2020. As Daniela mentioned, in May this year, the European Commission communicated on its tax agenda. They announced a legislative proposal for rules against the misuse of shell entities, ATA 3, by the fourth quarter of 2021, and will make a legislative proposal creating a Debt Equity Bias Reduction Allowance, DEBRA, by the first quarter of 2022. What you see on the very right end of the arrow, and which is called BFIT, refers to the Commission's long-term plan for what they call Business in Europe, Framework for Business, uh, framework for business Taxation, in short, BFIT. BFIT will provide for a single corporate tax rule book for the EU. While we are not going to speak in detail about this today, this BFIT pro proposal will replace the pending Common Consolidated Corporate Tax Base, in short, CCCTB. As it relates to BEPS 2.0, a historic tax agreement was reached in July this year, when the G20 finance ministers endorsed an OECD statement on the two-pillar solution of the BEPS 2.0 project. The exact timeline for the two pillars of this project are yet to be clarified, but the OECD statement indicates that a detailed implementation plan will be finalized by October 2021, so we should be seeing more details shortly. Let's take a look at what BEPS 2.0 comprises. The project is divided into two pillars. Pillar 1 addresses the allocation of taxing rights between jurisdictions and considers proposal for new profit allocation and nexus rules. Essentially, Pillar 1 addresses how to tax large multinational groups that generate profits in certain jurisdictions where they do not have a taxable presence under the current international tax rules. According to the OECD statement, Pillar 1 will particularly affect multinational groups with an annual turnover of at least 20 billion euro and a profitability of more than 10%. Well, in practice, there are not so many multinational groups whose turnover will place them on, within Pillar 1. So I'm not going to further elaborate on the technical details. Now, Pillar 2. Pillar 2 aims at developing a coordinated set of rules to address ongoing risks 
from structures that are viewed as allowing multinational enterprises to shift profits to no tax or low tax jurisdictions. Sounds complex, and it certainly is, but the premise behind pillar two is simple. If a state does not exercise its taxing rights at an adequate level, a new network of rules will reallocate those taxing rights to another state, which will. Important to realize about pillar two is, although the BEPS 2.0 um, plans adequate, adequately address the challenges of an increasingly digitalized economy, pillar two has nothing to do with digitalization. While pillar one aims at identifying uh, businesses, business models which are perceived to slip between the cracks of the existing international tax framework, Pillar 2 looks at low tax outcomes. How such low tax outcomes are achieved is largely irrelevant. The minimum tax, which was announced in the OECD statement in July, is at least 15%. This minimum tax would be introduced by a web of optional measures that could affect a large group of cross-border businesses. The regime is intended to apply to multinational groups with global revenues exceeding 750 million euro. This threshold is in line with current country-by-country -country reporting requirements. An interesting aspect of the new um, global minimum tax rules, particularly given the current economic environment, will be the extent to which losses are taken into consideration. Losses arising within the regime would be carried forward, but what about pre-regime losses? This is still unclear, but it was recognized that a failure to appropriately consider pre-regime losses could result in taxpayers being overtaxed. We thus expect to see, further, to see this further addressed. Certain restrictions may apply, such as time limits and anti-abuse provisions. What we are seeing already now in, is an increased interest of multinationals to consider whether latent losses can be crystallized in view of not losing an opportunity to recognize a relevant tax attribute before the new rules kick in. This could also be something that you may face in your group. Let's move over to some of the actions that the European Commission targets for the next two years. The Commission's tax agenda focuses on the two priorities of ensuring fair and effective taxation and promoting productive investment and entrepreneurship. As part of this, we can expect to see new EU directives on the implementation of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 in the EU. Within the next two years, the Commission will also target shell companies under the ATA 3 initiative and bring forward the debt equity bias reduction allowance we already mentioned. If we look at the ATA 3 initiative, the Commission is working on a legislative proposal setting out EU rules to neutralize what they call neutralize the misuse of shell companies for tax purposes. Broadly speaking, this would target companies with no or minimal um, uh, presence and real economic activity. The proposal would include actions such as requiring companies to report to the tax administration the necessary information to assess whether they have substantial presence and real economic activity. Beyond that, the proposal could include denying tax benefits linked to the existence or the, the use of abusive shell companies. It could also lead to creating new tax information, monitoring and tax transparency requirements. And the first important question, which I'm sure you'll also have, is what are shell companies? If you think about special purpose entities whose core business of, consists of group financing or holding activities, and which have no or only a few employees, well then certainly Luxembourg would also have a number of shell companies. A key point to consider is that special purpose entities should not be misunderstood in the sense as vehicles that facilitate tax avoidance. There are solid business reasons to use this kind of special purpose vehicles that is evident in, for example, lending or securitization transactions that are very common in Luxembourg. Let's take the example of a Luxembourg company that decides to issue a bond. In this case, often a special purpose vehicle is set up in order to facilitate this transaction and separate this issuance from the other activities of the group. The bank and other parties involved will require that the costs associated with the issuance are minimal, so these special purpose ve vehicles will most likely not have any employees. Actually, the European Central Bank that subscribes to the issuances of corporate groups has the same requirements in terms of the setup of special purpose vehicles and the associated costs. Holding companies 
may also be captured under the concept of shell entities, since these entities have no or few employees and limited or no physical presence. Also here, this can be an example of a good use of a shell company. The role of a holding company is merely to aggregate the participations in various entities within the group, and they typically cause little concerns regarding tax avoidance. There are many in the market who think that the new initiative is premature. Uh, the argument used is that there are already a number of tax rules which deal with the lack of substance, for example, existing anti-abuse rules, existing transfer pricing rules that would prevent profits being allocated without relevant economic risks and functions, and then has all also been European jurisprudence developed by the European Court of Justice, which gives guidance on conduit companies. The European Commission will need to clarify how far they would like to go with these measures targeting the shell companies, since a one-size-fits-all proposal is already triggering concerns for market players. The point raised is that substance should be always in proportion to the business activity of a company. What, a, what is an adequate level of substance for a particular taxpayer is difficult to capture with quantified criteria, like the number of employees. An interesting question, and maybe practically also for you, is whether the substance requirements, however they may look like, should be assessed on an aggregate basis at the level of the group in a given jurisdiction or individually at the level of each single entity. So overall, a lot of open questions still on this ATA3 initiative for now. But in our view, any EU measures should pay attention to the competitive positioning of the EU in an international context. If substance requirements increase remarkably, non-EU countries like the UK or Switzerland, for example, may gain attractiveness. As mentioned by Daniela, another important action of the European Commission is DEBRA, which aims at mitigating the bias between debt and equity financing in corporate taxation. As you know, in most tax systems, interest payments on debt are deductible. However, costs related to equity financing are mostly non-deductible, so there is a bias in the decision of businesses to invest via debt or equity. With this initiative, the European Commission would like to support businesses to enter the post-pandemic recovery phase. During COVID times, companies have accumulated excessive debt to finance their operations, and this makes them vulnerable to changes in the environment. Just to give you an example, the total debt level of EU corporation reached almost 100% of the GDP of the EU27 area. It is important to remember that the European Commission has already tried to propose an allowance for corporate equity as part of its common consolidated corporate tax base proposal, as mentioned earlier by Daniela, but little progress has been made in that area. This is why this topic is now addressed separately. But what does DEBRA practically entail? The European Commission is considering two options in order to reduce this debt equity bias. Option one would consist in excluding the deductibility of interest payment. While this would be a straightforward solution, it may also have the negative effect of repressing investments in the EU area. Option two would consist in granting deductions for equity-related payments. In practice, it means that a notional interest would be attributed to the equity investments and this would be regarded as deductible for tax purposes. The idea is not new. Forms of notional interest deduction are already implemented to some extent in countries such as Belgium, Cyprus, Italy, Malta, Poland and Portugal. As you may have already heard, Italy is one of the countries that actually decided to increase the level of notional interest that could be deducted during the pandemic in order to support businesses in need. There are, of course, certain elements that are still to be addressed before making a decision for one of the options. These elements refer in principle to the fact that additional measures would need to be put in place in order to ensure that this system does not leave room for abuse. Also, since small and medium enterprises do not usually benefit from equity investments, the European Commission will need to find solutions in order to make sure small and medium enterprises are not unfavored. In terms of timeline, the European Commission already started a public consultation in this area in July. That includes obtaining insights on which rate to be used, gathering ideas around measures that could mitigate the risk of abuse. The Commission is meant to draft a legislative proposal beginning of next year, so the initiative is advancing quickly, as you can see. Another interesting question is whether being granted a deduction for equity-related payments would actually be a game-changer for Luxembourg companies. 
The specific Luxembourg aspect to keep in mind here is net worth tax. As you probably know, this is an annual tax that is apply, applied, broadly speaking, on the net asset value of a company. While debt financing typically reduces the net worth tax basis of a company, having assets financed by equity instead could well lead to increased net worth tax costs. So overall, it has to be seen how attractive a deduction for equity related payments would be for Luxembourg entities. What do all these amendments mean for you as businesses? There will be little time to take a wait and see approach. The diversity and complexity of the proposed actions will put additional pressure on the way in which businesses are conducting their activities. There are certain actions that can already be considered today as of recognition, such as the recognition of latent losses. Also, it may be a good time to evaluate the quality of the documentation, which supports the commercial rationale of your financing structures on an ongoing basis. Overall, companies are recommended to further monitor these developments and assess the impact of the proposed rules on their business. It will certainly not be the last time you hear about these developments. Thanks for listening. Uh, we hope you liked the selection of the topics. Of course, please don't hesitate to reach out to Oana or myself um, if you need any assistance on the aspects that we covered. Thank you. Thanks to Daniela and Oana for this tax update and tips. And now let's move to the last presentation with ING, Gerd Song, Director of Working Capital Solution. While the working capital cycle is subjective to different industries, uh, it is beneficial to, for companies to compare themselves against their peers in similar industry. To improve working capital, most companies aim to shorten their working capital cycle by a faster collection of receivables, minimize inventory cycles and extend payment terms. How to optimize and improve working capital after a crisis remains a big issue. Gert will run through the ways of improving the alternative internal source of financing. Gert, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Gert Sung, heading ING's receivables finance business out of Belgium, Brussels. I'm here today to talk to you about ING's working capital solutions offering and what we have experienced during the pandemic. I'll, I'll cut this session into two sections. First of all, I'll start with an introduction about ING's offering uh, on the receivables finance side and on the payable side. Secondly, I'll also touch upon what we have noticed during the pandemic and especially how we reacted uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So let me start with the introduction and first uh, start with ING's offering. So what do, does ING offer? First on the receivables finance side. To cut it short, we offer the whole spectrum of receivables finance solutions. Meaning we do, we offer receivables finance discounting, receivables finance uh, for longer, for longer tenors, receivables finance in the way of corporate factoring, but also credit insured diversified for portfolio purchases up to receivables finance securitizations. Then to go to the receivables finance securitizations, we still have two options, which I will touch upon later as well. So first of all, on the line by line. So the line by line receivables finance options that we offer is basically purchasing buyer risk. We can do that on a credit insured basis or on a clean risk basis. Next to that, we also have the diversified portfolio approach mentioned as a securitization earlier, which is basically a strong man management, balance sheet management tool for the sellers as they can offload their complete book of receivables into an SPV or either the bank's balance sheet. Now, in terms of maturities, this can go from uncommitted up to two, three years committed or even longer, depending on the client's needs and what we, what we can offer as a general financing uh, package with the client. So what is now the impact of receivables finance structure with, uh, with the client? The assignment can be on a silent basis. So when the receivables are assigned to either an SPV of the bank, normally the buyers, depending on the jurisdictions and scope, are not notified of such a sale, which makes it very interesting from the for the treasury department of the seller to, to set up receivables finance transaction as he can get cash in quicker, but not having any impact on his client relationships. Then 
There is also the flexibility. What we offer basically is very flexible and it's made to the, to the client's needs. So we can set it up in many different jurisdictions where the client is based in Europe, in the US or in Asia. To come back on the International Corporate Receivables Finance product or the single name receivables discounting product, basically we are purchasing credit risk. That credit risk does not need to be disclosed to the buyer and we can purchase that on a clean basis, either on an insured basis. When we go more in the single B or double B area, we tend to have discussion with the client about credit insuring it. That can go either through ING's insurance, either through the client's insurance. What is key, to, what is key though, is that we have a good understanding of the buyer risk and, where, um, and how the buyer risk will evolve over time in terms of outstandings so that we can set the limit to the needs of the client. Also, this single name receivables discounting product can obviously be IFRS of balance sheet for the client. Then, to come back to the second product line, which is more the receivables finance securitization, we offer two types. So the credit insured one, we usually work with uh, Atradius, uh, Credendo, Euler Hermes or Kofas. So I would say the usual suspects, but we don't limit ourselves to only these insurers. We go further. We basically uh, check with the brokers, in, uh, either the client's broker, either ING's broker, what could be a suitable solution. What is very important there is that we feel comfortable with what the credit risk in, what the credit insurer is offering to the client and the bank. And we will touch upon that later also during the COVID-19 pandemic session. Secondly, next to the credit insurer, uh, credit insured program, we also have a conduit program where we basically bring the receivables into a bankruptcy remote SPV and that SPV issues notes which are then purchased by, by the conduit where the conduit then issues ABCP or asset-backed commercial paper. A regular standard and poor's compliant receivables finance transaction as you can typically see in the receivables finance securitization market. So these are basically the product suites we offer on the receivables finance side. Next to receivables finance, within working capital solutions, we also offer supply chain finance. Supply chain finance is basically taking buyer risk, but onboarding many hundreds or thousands of suppliers. We, within ING, we've started this business in 2010 and have grown throughout the years as basically one of the main providers in Europe, but also in the United States, of supply chain finance. We have our own platform, which we've developed throughout the years and which we continue to develop. And also, we, we, we partner with third-party platforms. Contrary to receivables finance, a platform on supply chain finance is even more important. A platform is the key for a smooth operating uh, supply chain finance offering, as you need to onboard and connect with many, many different suppliers, which is not the case on the receivables finance side. Therefore, we partner with the top uh, uh, technology companies uh, in the world active on the supply chain finance side. And I think we can be proud to say that we connect almost to, to all of them, which are very relevant in the space. Within the supply chain finance market, as the risk is far more concentrated than in the receivables finance market, it's also very important to have a user-friendly syndication offer, meaning that we connect, we can connect to banks, we can connect to trade finance funds, etc. etc. This makes it all very uh, attractive to use ING's uh, supply chain finance offering as we, as we can fairly say that we have a good offer in the market. Now, I would like to spend actually most time on what has happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen many different situations. As both the receivables finance and the supply chain finance product follow the working capital cycle of our clients, we've seen transactions coming down and we've seen transactions coming up. So what has happened actually at the outbreak of COVID-19? On the receivables finance side, imagine a factory closed down and clients kept on paying. Then the facility came down pretty, pretty rapidly but then the company needed cash to, to ramp up again uh, for, for the restart. So we've had, what have we done? We have reached out to all of our clients and basically discussed the financing needs that they had and the, and the expected scenarios for the, the weeks and months to come in terms of utilization and in terms of cash repayments and, ca and 
uh, and drawings. So we've, we've had more frequent drawings, we had more frequent cash rate payments, etc., etc. We have reached out to our clients in order to make sure that we could follow their working capital needs, both on the receivables finance side and on the supply chain finance side. Supply, chain got, supply chains got disrupted during COVID-19. Also, the supply chain from, from Asia to Europe got heavily disrupted and there was a clear need to support the key suppliers uh, of, of our clients on the SCF side. Then we also had to assess counterparty risk. So we had to assess uh, which are the strategic clients in our portfolio. Uh, we, I, I think I'm proud to say that we, we supported all of our clients very well during, uh, during the pandemic and we, we did not lose, lose any clients uh, in that phase. Now, there was also an impact from working from home. At the beginning, we had to install remote, remote procedures, but also check the remote procedures of our clients. We experienced many data uh, issues on the reporting side, um, on the ERP connection between ING and our clients. So also there, we had to have extensive discussions with our clients in order to, to sort that out, in order to make sure that the working capital finance facilities kept on running like they should. Now, there have also been some external developments. And one external development, which I would like to highlight to you, is basically the collapse of Greensill. Greensill was an important collapse in the, not only the supply chain finance market. Uh, first of all, I'll start with who, who, was, who is Greensill or who was Greensill. They became big through offering supply chain finance. But they went further. They offered, an, uh, they started to migrate also into the receivables finance space and also into some dodgy structures where, um, where the banks were typically not invested in. So what we have seen is that uh, although ING is connected to many different platforms, we as, as a bank, together with I think most of, of, of the European and American banks, can say that we did not follow green sales example and that we're truly financing working capital, uh, working capital facilities, which are truly short term, instead of receivables, which are rather from a perspective or provisional nature. This means that we, we have learned from, uh, from what has happened on the, the green sale case and that we can also say that we have uh, nicely come through the, the green sale area and that it is now clearly, clearly behind us. What have we done internally? Internally, we've increased the monitoring during the COVID-19 pandemic, increased monitoring with clients, increased monitoring on the portfolio, increased monitoring on the, the seller's financials, etc. We've also had some, some sectors which were more problematic than, than others, but in general, all went fine un until now. Um, then on the external side, what, is what has been a very important development on the receivables finance uh, market is the drop in insurance limits. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a tremendous drop in insurance limits. And it has to, to come to, to people's mind that it's very important to choose the right insurer for you on a receivables finance program. And there are many different types of insurers. You could, use for, you could go for cancelable limits or non-cancelable limits. People used to think that cancelable limits are absolutely fine and that it will cover their program very nicely and neatly. Now, things have shown to be differently. Non-cancelable limits have shown to be of a tremendous value for some of our clients at the outbreak of, of COVID-19. It also means that choosing the insurer is actually one of the, the very most important uh, elements when setting up a non-recourse non IFRS of balance sheet receivables finance program. The insurer needs to understand the client's business. So that's why we at ING, we obviously have our main insurers where we work with, but we offer a vast range of insur insurance providers and we tend to go with the insurer, the insurer who understands the clients best and also the insurer who is willing to invest in the future with the client and who is willing to invest in understanding the business of the client because that has shown to be tre tremendously important to have the necessary credit insurance limits and accordingly to also have the necessary funding for, uh, for your client. Because what are you with a committed uh, receivables finance facility if the insurance limits are not committed or if the insurance can withdraw at any point in time? 
That is one of the key takeaways for us and which is something where I would like to take questions onwards later on as well, obviously. What also is a high risk at the outbreak of, of COVID was the increased risk, risk for fraud. Getting data in has shown to be more difficult in the beginning as ERPs were not, and people were not in the office, people had not always access to the, to the systems, cash reconciliation was more difficult and the sales ledgers were also not always completely up to date which made it more difficult to track the, the follow-up of the working capital facility needs. The, in, there was also an increased need for, for liquidity. But what do you do when there is an increased need for liquidity while data is lagging? Because these products are very data-driven. This means that we have invested more in a better data connection with our clients, in an automated data transfer, and make sure that what we what we do is always live in terms of data so that we can offer the best possible way of financing to our clients. Now, how did we react? Cash is king, obviously, in, in working capital facilities. And we've been very close to our clients and very clear that we, we would support them and that we would try to do our best to get cash in at the companies as fast as possible based on, on through uh, and through data. We've also given our clients market updates. So we've linked our clients to, to our economist departments and uh, made sure that all of the, the clients were up to speed on, on the latest market developments. But that also is valid both ways. So clients also gave us updates. We have given our clients updates on what we know. And together with uh, our clients, we have come to, I think, a better situation to manage through that crisis um, for, for all of us together. I think. It's fair to say that post COVID-19, we have an increased need for working capital facilities. We have, we have seen an increased need for receivables finance, but also an increased need for supply chain finance. And the demand on the supply chain finance side is even stronger than, than ever before. And treasury, treasury departments of our clients tend to realize that funding working capital has even become more important than ever in order to make sure that you do not disrupt the supply chain and that you do not disrupt the short-term financing of the companies. This was it on IG's Working Capital Solutions offering and also on how we have seen the, the pandemic. I'm happy to take questions and thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for attending our virtual event tonight. Looking forward to seeing you for our next hybrid conferences in fall and winter. In case you have questions, please do not hesitate to forward them to attend and we will forward them to our speakers. You will get answers, I promise. Thanks again to our sponsors, ING, JP Morgan, BNP Paribas, Bearing Point, EY and Bottomline for their contribution. Have a nice evening. Cheers.